Greetings. Welcome to Maisha Kazini. I've been thinking about uh, our current political moment, especially through the, the lens of knowledge. Of course, I talk a lot about knowledge because of our of our, the way we are educated. And so I've been looking at the knowledge dimensions of our current political moment of the protests. Uh, in this video, I want to talk specifically about the current, I think it's a misunderstanding between the two generations, uh, roughly called Gen X and Gen Z, although I will show that really what we are talking about is different knowledges. And the problem that I've noticed is that uh, Gen X's can't understand what Gen Z's are complaining about or why they are persisting with the protests. And then Gen Z's have tried to explain and explain. And because the Gen X's are not understanding, the Gen Z's are wondering, why can't the Gen X's understand what we are saying? It's like we are in a knowledge deadlock and that's what I wanted to explain. Because this is kind of abstract, I'm going to use uh, diagrams from our, our presentation. Uh, so those of you who don't like uh, thinking about uh, ideas or uh, pre who prefer solutions, concrete solutions, this is probably not the video for, for you. Um, for the rest of us who want to understand how we think, or at least to reflect on how we think, uh, here we go. I've decided to look at knowledge like a tree, that there are parts of the tree that we can see, uh, the leaves and the branches and the tree trunk, and there are parts of the tree that we know are there, but that we don't always see, which is the roots. And the roots are the ones that feed the tree. And I think knowledge is like this. There's knowledge which is conscious, which we are aware we know. So for example, uh, I learned in school that two plus two is four. So I was aware that I was learning it. And when I say it, I am aware that it's something that I was taught. So that's conscious knowledge where I know that I know what I know. And then there's this subconscious knowledge, which uh, normally I, I'm not conscious of. I'm not conscious of, but if I get a little push or a little inspiration, I'm, I, I become aware that I know something. And so, for example, if I see um, a mango tree with nice fruits and I and somebody tells me, you know, I've known you for five years and every time I've, I've noticed that every time you pass a mango tree that has many fruits, there's a way you smile and you're happy. And then I'll be like, oh, yeah, actually, you mean you can see it? I'm happy because my first memory of seeing a mango tree like this, this was what was happening. And every time when I see the tree, I remember that memory. So that is knowledge which I become, which I knew, but I become aware of it because now somebody, there has been a stimuli that has made me think about it. And then there's the unconscious knowledge. This is the knowledge which we may not know that we know, or it will take a very long time for it to come to the surface. Um, and this is why people, you know, go around doing interviews just to collect the unconscious knowledge of our people. And actually, I became conscious of this, of unconscious knowledge after the 2017 elections, when I heard what Cambridge Analytica did. What they did was to dip into our subconscious to tap into the, the, the things that we know, but we are not aware that we know. Politicians are really, really good at tapping into our unconscious knowledge. For example, I've started to feel that when politicians appeal to tribalism, it is not our culture or our ethnicity that they are appealing to. They are appealing to our insecurity. You see, because Kenyan life is so insecure, because we have a political logic where it's always being disrupted. We cannot plan over two, three years. We get surprises all the time from funny laws, police or something. We, we, our lives are so disrupted. Uh, we, we feel very insecure and we feel that our families and our ethnic groups are our security. So for example, 
if I get sick and I can't pay the bill, I go to my community and they raise the money for me. So our communities, our ethnic communities are, are our security. When politicians are appealing to the ethnic communities, it's not culture that they are appealing to, it's that insecurity. When they are saying that security you find in your ethnic group, it won't be there if I don't go to government, if you don't elect me, even that security which you think you have in your ethnic group will no longer be there. So when they're appealing to tribe, they're appealing to our insecurity, but we are not aware of it because it's in our unconscious. This slide now shows what I think is the areas that build the different areas of knowledge. So I think the conscious is built through work, through experience, through education and law, and Kenyans do this. They say, oh, the constitution says, I learned this from school. I learned this from work. So the knowledge we learn from these areas is knowledge we are conscious that we have. And then there's the, the subconscious knowledge, which I think comes from our emotion and our memory. It's That's where it's stored. Let me go back to the example of the, the mango tree that makes me happy. You see, the happiness is a reflection of that knowledge that I have, of that experience that I have had. So when I smile or I feel good, it's because that is an expression of knowledge that I have that has come from another time. And it's the same thing as memory. Memory is the knowledge that we build over time, which influences the way we behave in the present and in the future. So you can see why history is important. History is how we build knowledge through memory so that when we meet a new situation, we are making decisions based on past experiences, hopefully good past experiences that inform uh, what we decide to do in the present. Because if you don't have any memory, you, you need to be programmed like a robot. And that's why memory is important, history is important. And then our unconscious comes from politics and it comes from spirituality. By politics, I'm talking about how we distribute uh, resources and how we distribute power. Those, the way we distribute power and resources explains to us subconscious, unconsciously what is, is important and what is not. And sometimes we are not even aware of it. So for example, um, there was one time I criticized a pastor and I was rebuked for criticizing the Lord's anointed. Uh, that idea that uh, if somebody is a pastor, you cannot critique what they are saying is an expression of the way we see power in Kenya. We see power as a hierarchy where there are some above and some below and we can, and those below cannot question those above. Now, that 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 political that's a politics of knowledge, meaning power is exercised by people who are above you. And it translates not only in the church, even in the school, when teachers beat you, because if you ask many questions, you're seen as rude. That's another way of telling you, not consciously, of course, the teacher will say, you are misbehaving, you're rude, you're, you don't listen. But really what they are communicating to your subconscious is that you should not question anybody, that those in authority are always right. So that's how politics uh, teaches us unconsciously. And that's why the politicians had the guts to flaunt around their wealth, because unconsciously they accepted the lesson of Kenya, which is that if you're in power, you can do no wrong and people have no right to criticize you. And then our spirituality also... Uh, gives us the language of the unconscious. And please, people, I'm not talking about the church alone because the church is an institution. Christianity is just one way of exercising spirituality. I'm talking about spirituality in terms of our connection to the universe, to the intangible uh, part of the world. Um, that connection determines what we know. So whatever is communicated in our spiritualities, whichever faith we go to, it builds a certain kind of knowledge which we express through the more visible levels of our knowledge. If, if you're standing there where you see the conscious over here, if you're standing 
looking at the tree from the outside, you can't see the roots. If you're limited to your conscious, you will think that the tree ends at the soil. To be able to see the whole tree, even though, even though you can see a tree with your eyes, you know underneath there are roots. I call that consciousness. Consciousness, consciousness is the knowledge that this, there's a whole system and the system is constructed. And you're kind of stepping back, looking from outside and looking at the system and seeing that the way we think, the way we react, the way we feel has been constructed in a certain way. It's not an act of God, but the product of human society. And when Steve Biko talks about black consciousness, he's not talking about cultural pride. That's only one part of it, as you can see from the diagram. What he's saying is that as black people, we are conscious that the system, the racist system we are in is a constructed form of, of knowledge and that we can see how it is done politically, spiritually, through work, through education, through law. That's all that it is. That's what consciousness is. It's being able to see how the system works. Unfortunately, in Kenya, we have confused pride in our cultures with consciousness. And it is possible for people to be proud of their cultures, but be hopelessly unconscious, have no consciousness at all. As we see, especially from politicians from, from Central, they'll talk so much about being proud in cultures, but they have no political consciousness. They can't even see that what they are saying sometimes is absurd. Now, that distinction between just the conscious, where you're looking at what is immediately accessible, to the consciousness, when you're looking at the whole system and you can see how it has been constructed by power and institutions, that, I think, is the difference between Gen X and Gen Z. I think that Gen X is stuck at the conscious. We can't see beyond the, the, the visible. And that's why we insist on on uh, solutions. We want tangibles, material, materialist things. And when you start talking about the underground, the subconscious, the memory, the theory, the thinking, the, the spirituality, the ideas, then they start telling you, how is that relevant? Where is the solution? And that's the same what's the reason why they can't understand a leaderless movement, because a leaderless movement is organic. In fact, that's the word people are be using. It's organic. It's coming from the roots of people's experiences, their memory, their, their understanding of politics. And because Gen Xs do not value knowledge beyond the visible, they can't understand what Gen Zs are talking about. And meanwhile, Gen Zs can see the system doesn't work. So what is happening is that Gen X said, okay, see, I came to your X space and I listened to you. So now we'll have negotiations. And then now they expect Gen Zs to be happy because then they're operating at the conscious and Gen Zs are, have a consciousness that the system doesn't work. And that's where we are stuck. We have a knowledge crisis between a limited conscious, which has power, and a bigger consciousness, which is saying that the whole system is rigged. So this is what I think is the difference between the two generations. And by the way, here, I'm not talking about generation in terms of age, but in terms of consciousness and conscious. There are younger people who think like Gen Xs, and there are older people who think like Gen Zs. So it's not strictly an age thing. It's just that the, high, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have a consciousness, and the older you are, you're, the more likely you are to not understand. So this is what I think the Gen X problem is. My generation was raised on the idea that everything is about power and wealth. So we work hard, supposedly go to school, we, we struggle hard to, be, to enter politics. So when we reach there, we feel I've reached power and wealth and nobody should talk no, nobody should challenge me. For us, 
our generation, we were raised to see power and money as our validity. When we went to school, that's what we were targeting. We were targeting that we'll work hard, we'll get this degree, then we'll have wealth and power, or we'll join government and have wealth and power. And so we are not able to see our lives in anything, any other measure apart from that. For those of us who don't get that wealth and power, we are looked at as if we are not successful. And that is what, for us, work, experience, education are for. They are for gaining wealth and power. They are not for any other thing. And then uh, when it comes to our subconscious, our subconscious is imperialism, meaning that we feel that it's the West that determines what is what, what development is, that they are the ones who set the standards for the way we should think about life. So this is where you see so much money being spent on benchmarking, people feeling proud that they have lived or traveled abroad. Um, also, even like the talk of foreign investors, you remember that MP who was saying, let's tax the cars so that foreign investors can come and build roads. So there's so much focus of my generation on foreigners. Even our tourism industry is about foreigners. And the thing is, if you put it to them directly and say you people worship foreigners, they'll say, no, 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 we don't worship foreigners. We are proud of our culture. Nee, 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 nee. But really, at the end of the day, they don't feel validated unless what they are doing is recognized abroad. And that's why we are exporting our children abroad. We are always looking for foreign accolades. So that's, that's how uh, our subconscious as, as a generation is. And then when it comes to our unconscious, we think in terms of supremacy or what E.S. Atieno Diambo called ideology of order, meaning that there has to be a hierarchy. There has to be someone on top, people underneath him, people underneath that person, like that, like that. And that you can't challenge the person above you and that you need to fit into your place. So in fact, CBC, that's what it's saying that you need to fit where you are. If your parents are not educated and can't help you with the homework, then you do, you become a cook or you become Tibet. You should not aspire for anything above your rank. And what that means is that because of that, that's why the government cannot hear what the, the young people are saying because they are thinking, no, follow the, the hierarchy of order. Have you done public participation? Have you uh, gone to see your MP? And then even after you tick all these boxes, they still tell you you have not done enough. In the education system, it is worse. Like in the universities, people don't believe you unless you can cite a Mzungu name to, to back up what you're saying, unless you have a source to quote uh, Chichi, unless you have a source, they won't listen to you. So there's this hierarchy where the West is the one that decides what should be done, and we should not challenge anyone, or that even worse, we should not know anything that the person above us does not know. And if we dare show that we know something that our superior doesn't know, then they really hammer us. And that has, that's what has happened. And that's why there's this passivity in my generation. We feel that there's no point trying to change anything because every time we've known something or we've excelled in something, we've been crushed because we dared to be better than the person above us. When it comes to Gen Z, I think they have a different type of knowledge. One is that their consciousness is not built on power and wealth. It's built on creativity, work, and accountability. So you're hearing them say, we want employment, we can't work, and yet you're taxing us even before we have found work. Or they are being creative, especially with the digital space. They are coming up with new ways of thinking, new knowledges. They are creating new stuff. And most of all, they are asking for accountability. They are saying the fact that you're in power doesn't mean you do not have anything to answer to the people below you. Because the people below you are the ones producing the wealth. So you can't just use it how you want and not be accountable to the people who produce that wealth. And then Gen Zs are also people who care. That's their subconscious. Their subconscious is to care for each other rather than to care for what foreigners think. So um, you, you can see like with the protests, they're taking care of each other's bills. The doctors are treating protesters. The lawyers are following the protesters when they are being charged. 
people are sharing and talking about the guys who have been abducted. So there's a there's a, an ethic of care which my generation doesn't have. Us, the thing we want to know is what do Azungu think? And then uh, Gen Zs also have a different unconscious. Then they are about community. You see even this instinct for them to help each other, like that guy, I don't know if you saw the video, that guy who ran onto the street to pick up his injured friend. That's not an ethic that my generation knows. For us, you Maliza people, you get to get where you want. So that's, and I'm not saying that all Gen Zs are, are like this and Gen Xs are all selfish, but what we are seeing is a clash between two unconsciousness. One which wants community, which wants to think of, about the world, and the other one which just wants to think about following the order, following the hierarchy. How do we go forward? Meaning what's the solution? This video was just to help us understand. I think um, a lot of the things that we conceptualize in terms of the way the government is behaving, people are talking about as if the government is scheming that they understand what Gen Z is, what they've just, they, it's just that they've refused to listen. I don't think that's the case. I think it's it's a conscious. They, they can't see themselves outside of the system that they are in. So for example, when you have these politicians who are taxing us to the heavens, and then they go around showing off about the cars they own and the clothes they wear. That's people who can't see themselves. They can't see how they look to the rest of us. And when we tell them that what you're doing is so, is so ignorant and so insensitive, then they think the problem is the dancing that the problem is the video in which they danced and showed off about their shoes. And so now they say, sorry, we won't do that again. But that's not the issue. The issue is the system you are in allows you to do that. It's because you think of power and wealth. It's because you don't think people below you have a say. It's because you don't think they also have a point of view. That's why you can afford to show off and flaunt your wealth because you don't think we have an opinion. So it's a clash of the way we think about life and about knowledge. It's not simply about generations or about political, um, political positions. What does that mean going forward? I think it's just good to be conscious. Remember the roots. If we have good roots, we can be able to grow strong stems that can weather the storms. So if we know that this is what is going on, then we can plan accordingly what is a more effective way of going around the struggles for a better Kenya. And our struggle is to change the soil in which our tree is growing. We cannot keep on growing it in the soil of selfishness, in the soil of plunder and looting and people who have no taste or aesthetics, no sense of beauty. They feel that nobody should, should have a good life except them. We want to change that soil so that our children can grow up in a world where life matters, community matters, and they can grow to be strong, healthy trees that will provide shade to the next generation.